Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, tonight we are going to embark on a journey, and this journey is going to be titled uh, A Place, A Dimension. Let's put it this way. We'll call it this. A Dimension Called Heaven. We have, um, in the last week, Loretta and I have been to a couple of funerals. Many of you have been to funerals. A lot of things are happening in this world. Uh, Joyce, her mother, just passed away. And when... When you see that there are those that we know, either friends or relatives, that are stepping over into the other side, we need to understand as Christians that the reality of heaven is, is something that should be strong inside of us, and it shouldn't be just a Bible story about a fictional place where if you're good, you go there, and if you're bad, you go to hell, but the reality is, is nobody really knows what's going to happen. And we should know exactly, precisely what's going to happen because the Bible tells us. Now, I am constantly amazed. I have a lot of ministers who are my friends, good ministers, but I'm, I meet ministers on a regular basis through my ministers association and just through the years of, of growing up with, with Bible studies and people out of these Bible studies becoming pastors. I just know a lot of ministers. But I am shocked at how many ministers don't know what the Bible says about heaven, about hell, about the afterlife. And you get this all the time. At a funeral, people say, well, they're in a better place. Oh, that's nice. Are they at the, at the shopping mall? You know, no, where are they? Well, they're in a better place. Well, where is that place? Well, it's, they're in heaven. What are they doing? Well, I, I am, I'm not really sure what they're doing, you know. Well, are they thinking right now? And, and it's amazing how many people believe in soul sleep. They believe that when you die, that your soul and your spirit just goes into some kind of suspended animation like in a science fiction movie where your cryogenics come in and, and you're, you're frozen and then someday they'll thaw you out and they, they think that you, you aren't going to know anything until, until they don't know when. When you say, well, when are they going to wake up from the soul sleep? They can't tell you when they're going to wake up. The reason they can't tell you is because the Bible doesn't say anything about soul sleep. There is no waking up from soul sleep. So any answer you give, you've got to make it up. And I am so tired of made-up theology, Hollywood theology, and things that people say that are cliches that just sound okay. I think as Christians, we need to know the truth. And every one of us, every one of us should be able to clearly tell somebody exactly what happens when you die where you will be in five years after you die where you'll be in a thousand years where are you going to be in a million years let me ask you something if you are truly going to live in eternity where are you going to be in a billion years and what are you going to be doing and what are you going to look like well see a lot of people just they don't know but what's interesting is, is the Bible clearly tells us step by step by step. Now, the Bible also tells us that in order to understand the future, you have to lay a foundation in the past. You know, you can, you can say it this way about the, the Jews and Christians. Uh, Judaism, now, now follow me on this and don't get weird with this, but Judaism can stand alone without Christianity. But Christianity cannot stand alone without Judaism because our faith is built on the foundation of the patriarchs. And all of this, what we call the Old Testament that went on before, 
And so there has to be a foundation. You know, you can't build a house unless you build a foundation. Well, you can, but according to the Bible, the first storm that comes away, it's going to be gone. So what I want to start doing in this journey that we take called a dimension called heaven is lay some foundation. Are you ready? You ready? You got your cement mixer out? Your spiritual cement mixer, we're going to build a foundation. Let's, um, let's first of all just clarify some very simple things. Uh, let's take a look at uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Now some of these things we will, we will review later in more depth, but just some very simple things. Jesus said, in this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, what this tells us clearly is that when Jesus was telling his disciples to pray, he was telling them the location of his Father. So, don't forget about all the other. You need to know all the other that it's talking about here. But one thing that's kind of hidden away. The Father is in heaven. So, let's take a look at another verse. Deuteronomy 26.15. Deuteronomy 26.15. It says, look down from your... See that your there? Look down from your holy habitation. That your is because it's talking about God the Father. Look down from your holy habitation. Where? From heaven. Now what's a habitation? A habitation is where you live. Look on your driver's license. Find the address. That's your habitation. That's not your visitation. Your visitation is the resort you go to for your vacation. And many people are wanting a visitation from God. When the reality is, is God's looking for a habitation, he, he wants us to be united and not just on vacation with him. He wants us to live in him. But look down. Okay, now, we're going to get real simple on this because my, my parents were hillbillies, and in order to understand things, sometimes you've got to get real clear. If God is supposed to look down from his holy habitation then his holy habitation is up. Now, I, I know this, this sounds real basic, but that's telling us that he's looking down from his holy habitation. In other words, his habitation is up, and his holy habitation where he is looking down from is heaven. So this tells us, once again, this may seem very basic, but the reality is heaven is up. All right? And bless your people and the land which you have given us, just as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, we're going to take a look at another scripture over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll start with verse 2. And Paul is talking here, and he says, I know a man in Christ. Now, here's an interesting thing. Paul does this sometimes. He's talking about himself. All right? He's talking about himself. He's saying, I know a man, but the man he's talking about is him. He said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, that was when he was in Lystra, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know, God knows, such a one, another himself, such a one was caught where? Up. Where did we say heaven was earlier? Up. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And now I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he, referring to himself, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, we, we find a lot of nuggets in this passage here. First of all, he confirms that he was caught, what? Up into heaven. But he tells us something here that's a little different. He said he was caught up into the third heaven. Now, if he was caught into the 
third heaven, then that must mean that there is a first heaven and a second heaven, and that there are heavens. All right? Then he says, he says, now look, this thing happened in such a way, whether my body went up or my spirit or whatever, I don't know how it happened, but he says, here's the bottom line, I went there. And he says that when he was there, he heard inexpressible words, which it's not lawful for him to speak. In other words, he heard things when he was in the third heaven that were so unique that for some reason it was illegal. It was unlawful for him to repeat those words here on earth. Now, you know, I think I've always thought this is funny with, with Paul. There's another place where he says, he's talking to his friends and to some people he's trying to teach. And he says, look guys, I've been there and I've been here. And I'd rather be there. But because of you knuckleheads, i got to stay here. And see, that also lets us know that there in the third heaven was a much better place than here on the first earth. Now, there's another nugget tucked away here. He says that he was taken up into the third heaven, and he says, likewise, he was taken up into paradise. So that lets us know that paradise is at the time of Paul. Now, we're going to discuss this more as the sessions go on. But at the time of Paul, paradise was in the third heaven. Now, always keep this in mind. Paul the Apostle lived in the same framework of time that we live in. It was after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and before the return of Jesus. Now, Paul lived in that time. Now, granted, he lived in the early stages of that time. We are now in the late stages of that time. But we are under the same rules and regulations. Paul... Paul was just a man, like Mark Garrett or Bill Moore. Just, he, he was just a man who got saved. And he's a part of the church, a born-again believer. Now, now here's, here's the bottom line on that. Anything that happened in the Bible, anything that happened in the Bible from the time that Jesus was resurrected and put his blood on the mercy seat until the time he comes back. And he's already put his blood on the mercy seat and he hasn't come back. So anything that happens in that time framework to any Christian can happen to you. In other words, you could be caught up to the third heaven whether in body or in your spirit, I don't know, only God knows. And you, you can hear inexpressible words that's unlawful to tell anybody. Because there probably, there's not words. One version of the Bible puts it this way. I can't, I can't tell you what I heard because there are not words in the language that adequately describe what I heard. See, anything that happened to Paul in the New Testament can happen to you. Anything that happened to Peter in the New Testament can happen to you. If an angel appeared to Peter and did something miraculous, an angel can appear to you and do something miraculous. Hmm. Okay. Now, I want you to start thinking just a little bit of heaven as a different dimension and not try to think of it as distance, but a different dimension. 
I want you to think of it. In our house, we have this one wall that has, has blinds. Um, I forget what brand they are, but at any rate, they're, they're those, there's a blind store down here. I've often thought they should rename that. You know, and the guy should make up business cards and he can call himself Bartimaeus, the blind man. <laughs> oh, well, whatever. Okay, at any rate, so we have these curtains and you pull the cord and you can't see on the other side. You can be right up against it and somebody can be out on the deck right up against the window on the other side. You can be inches away from each other and you can't see each other but you just pull that cord a little bit and there's a shift and all of a sudden they're right there. Now, let me tell you why I, be I personally believe that heaven has multiple ways of being described. Yes, it is up and there is a distance. Paul was caught up. He literally moved from one place to another. However, we also need to understand that there are dimensional shifts in the realm of the Spirit. And um, just, just let me give you an example. Stephen, he was the first martyr in the New Testament. He was the first one to be killed for the gospel's sake that we know of. And um, it says that when they were stoning him, that he looked up into heaven and he saw he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, if heaven is billions of light years away, he had more than 20-20 vision, I would say. I think, I personally believe that what happened is there was just a shift, and his eyes were able to see what was near him. Now, yes, it wasn't right on him. There was a distance. But it wasn't as far as what people might think. Do you remember Elijah? He, uh, he had, uh, Elijah had the king of Syria, I believe it was, that was really on to him. And, and uh, it finally got to the point where the, the king of Syria, every time he would send his army out to defeat the is Israelites, it, it's like the Israelites knew what was going to happen. They had insider information, and, and so they were prepared, and they'd shifted, and they'd moved in. And the king of Syria just couldn't seem to get anything done. And so finally, he, he brought his inner circle in, and he, he gathered them all into, the, into his headquarters, kind of like having a cabinet meeting. And he said, okay, guys, <laughs> he said, we've we got to have a talk here. One of you is a traitor. Somebody in this room is getting a message to the king of Syria, or excuse me, the king of Israel, and giving him all of our battle plans. Because every time we plan a battle, it's like he knows what we're going to do before we do it. Well, one of the brave young men said, King, let me tell you something. They've got a prophet over there in Israel. His name's Elijah. And, and he knows everything that goes on here. He even knows what you do in your bedroom. Well, that kind of freaked out the, the king of Syria. So he sent an army. He says, he says, go get Elijah. Bring him back. So they went and they surrounded Elijah. And they had armies, chariots. I mean, a massive army. And so Elijah kind of paraphrasing the story a little bit, he kind of gets up and he's having his morning coffee and he's standing outside of the, the cabin on the front porch kind of looking around and he's, his assistant comes out, his number two man, and he says, whoa! <laughs> he says, look at this Syrian army. And Elijah says, drinking his Starbucks, and he says, he says, well, let me tell you something. Don't be as scared, son, because there's more with us than there is with them. And you can just see that assistant thinking, man, Elijah, he took too much NyQuil. Something's wrong with that boy. <laughs> so he, he looks around and he, he's counting the thousands of chariots, and then he looks at Elijah and he goes, one, two. You know, it's 
How can there be more with us than there is with them? How can that be? And Elijah said, it's all recorded in the Bible. Elijah said, he said, here's the deal. Lord, open his eyes so he can see. And somehow a shift took place. And the blinds turned. And he could see. And there were armies of God's creation. Angels ready for battle all over. And there were more of them than there were of the Syrians. Now here's the thing you got to understand. He saw into the dimension of the supernatural. When Elijah said, Lord, open his eyes that he can see, it wasn't at that moment that God said to himself, whoa, if he's going to see what's going on down there, I better send some angels. And then all of a sudden, he sends a bunch of angels and opens the eyes of the assistant. No, the army of God was already there. They just couldn't be seen. Now, what I believe is when the Scripture says we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses cheering us on, and we know that it's the saints that have, and the patriarchs that have gone on before, and they're looking to us and cheering us on to do exploits for the kingdom of God. They're not that far away. Now, I'm going to digress into something that is just a personal opinion. And I always want you to know, when I have an opinion, it's an opinion as opposed to Scripture. When I, when I give you something out of the Scripture, I'm going to tell you this is the way it is. But my opinion is kind of like if I had a pet dog. You know, you can, you can pet it or you don't have to. You know? <laughs> so here's the thing. I believe that those have gone, who have gone on before are close enough that sometimes you can sense them. I know of children that have uh, sensed a parent you say, well, that can't be. Well, let me, let me tell you something. Those that have gone on before, the world calls them dead. The Bible calls them departed. And although their bodies may be dead, their spirits are not dead. And we will cover this later, but they have still full use of all their faculties. And they're praying for you. As I've said many times, <laughs> I, I love this story. The guy stopped me out in the atrium one day right after his mother had died. And he said, the one thing I miss about my mom is he said, she always prayed for me every day. I looked at him and, and it, it just came out of my spirit. I hadn't even, even thought about this before. I said, what makes you think your mom's not still praying for you? What makes you think that she's no longer praying for you? She's not dead. She's not in soul sleep. Just because she's with the Lord doesn't mean she's not still interceding on your behalf. And I believe that there are scriptures that lean strongly that way. So I believe that there's a dimensional shift that takes place sometimes and our eyes can be opened and we can see. And I need for us to, before we go on this long journey, and it, it may be a long journey, on a dimension called heaven, we need some foundational truths. And uh, we need to know what took place before the creation of man. You know, if I uh, were to buy a house, an old house, one of the first things I'd want to know when I moved in it is, who lived here before me and what did they do and how did this plumbing get into the state that it's in? And who wired the house? You know what I'm saying? I want to know something about it. And I think it's kind of uh, strange when people don't want to know what happened in history before man was created. And we, we need to understand 
why all of this stuff came together the way it did. See, if, if we understood some of the things of the past, we would understand why angels are here now doing what they're doing because we would know where they came from and why they did what they did to get where they are. Okay. Before the creation of man, we need to understand this. In His eternal existence, God, through the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, these three are one, created everything that was made. Now, I'm, I'm a, a person who I really like the science channel. I, Loretta's grandfather, he worked for NASA. I mean, he worked on the Apollo 8 program. I, we went down to, to Huntsville and and we went in this big room. He took us on a tour and he showed us all the wiring that he did around the, the band that goes around the outside of the capsule. I mean, uh, her dad was an engineer, vice president of Kansas City Power and Light in Kansas City. I mean, I married into to some smart people. You, you know what I'm saying? But I like science. I like science. I like the Discovery Channel. And um, it's interesting how Things have changed over the years. When I was in high school, I remember watching, or excuse me, in grade school, I remember watching a, a program in, in class talking about the moon. How on one side of the moon it was a thousand degrees, and on the other side of the moon it was a thousand degrees below zero. Yeah, I don't know if anybody ever remembers those stories. Well, that's what they believed. I mean, that, we didn't even have satellites or anything back in those days. And I remember being taught that our solar system, all the way out to Pluto, and they illustrated that with some little dog from Disney, you know. But all the way out to Pluto was all there was. And there's just stars out there. And then as time went by, and they had the Mount Palomar telescope in San Diego, and they built the Hubble telescope it's in space and now there's one a hundred times stronger than the Hubble telescope that's in space and we got a space station floating around now they've discovered that most of those stars weren't really stars but galaxies like the Milky Way and and most of those what we look up in the night sky and we see as a star is actually a galaxy that has hundreds of billions of stars with hundreds of billions of planets. And every day that goes by, they're discovering that the universe is bigger than what it was the day before. Well, they've calculated back to where they believe that the Big Bang took place 13.8 billion years ago. And if you can kind of grasp this, and I don't want to digress into science too much here, but with a telescope, just basic information, with a telescope, as they look into space, they're looking back into time. Now, how long does it take for light to get from the sun to the earth? The sun's 93 million miles away. Does anybody know? Light moves at 186,000 miles per second. That's exactly correct. But it takes about eight minutes or somewhere thereabouts. So, now, now follow me on this. So if you are looking, if you put some glasses on to where it's okay to look at the sun, when you look at the sun, what you are seeing is the sun eight minutes ago. You're not seeing the sun now. The sun may be gone for all you know. All you know is eight minutes ago it was there. Now the objects you look at further away, the further away you get in light years, the further back in time you get. Now, I know this sounds kind of weird. So the deeper they get with their telescopes, the farther back in time. So if, if you are looking at a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars in it, and let's say, for example, that galaxy is 13 billion light years away that means you are seeing that galaxy 13 billion years ago now 
It may not even be there. It may have, it, it may have not been there when Moses was in diapers. I mean, you know. So the whole thing is, is science now is beginning to, without them knowing it, agree with the Bible. Because what they're saying is that 13.8 billion years ago, in a moment of time, in a speck that is smaller than a dime, within a millisecond, everything came into being. And <clears throat> what, <laughs> what I heard this week was... Um, and this is on the NASA channel, they said it was quite a while in this early universe before stars came into existence. And it all has to do with the hydrogen and all that. And I don't want to get into science, but I'm just saying this. The Bible says that they were created on the fourth day. Science used to say in the beginning were the stars, and everything came out of the stars. All the, all the dust, everything came out of the stars. Now all, the, all of a sudden, they're saying, no, the stars weren't created first. Now, was there a Big Bang? Well, yeah, probably. But I believe the Big Bang was God's voice. And when it was, you know, oh, I don't want to take up all of our time with these kind of sometimes silly earthly theories, but now, now think about this. There is a group of scientists, and I'm talking, these guys are brainiacs. You could add all of our IQs in this room together, and it probably doesn't equal one of these guys. I mean, they are way out there. And this guy came on, he was on the NASA channel. And now, now follow me on this. He says, all of outer space that we see is not really there <laughs> he said I am working on an al algorithm or whatever it is working on some kind of computer deal to prove that it's like has anybody ever seen Star Trek okay it's like a, a holodeck it's a holograph it's it's we see it and we can measure it, but it's not really there. And I thought to myself as he said this, wouldn't it be interesting if God created us and the heavens and the earth, and we got our sun and the moon and all this kind of stuff, and everything out there is just some kind of illusion. Interesting. Well, now think of it this way. And people ask silly questions all the time. Was Adam created with a belly button? That type of stuff, you know. Um, but when God created Adam, he didn't create him as a baby. He created him as an adult man. So a scientist, a doctor, let's, let's say a doctor, a doctor could examine Adam and say, he's 30 years old. Why would you say he's 30 years old? Because he's aged 30 years. Well, what makes you think he's aged 30 years? Because he's aged 30 years. When in reality, God created him. God created him in the now, but he created him, now follow me on this, with a history. Created him with a history. So, that's kind of like a spy movie that I saw a few weeks ago, they had this, this spy, and they said, okay, now we're going we're gonna to make up a name for you, and we're going to create an entire backstory of your life. You know, you were a plumber from Poland, and the, you know, they create this story, and everything's a fictitious. But he steps out into this other country, with a complete new identity and a complete new made-up past. We can never, here's, here's the deal, we can never discount God 
or limit him to what we think he has done. We only prove him by what he has told us he has done. And anything outside of this can be scientific poppycock. So when we talk about all these scientific things and people want to argue them, here's the reality. I don't know. I wasn't there 13, 8 billion years ago. I wasn't there. I don't know. But here's what I'd like to ask one of these scientists. What existed 13.9 billion years ago? <laughs> I mean, you, you're all talking about the Big Bang. What happened the day before the bang? What existed? And now they're coming up with an entire universe that doesn't have atoms and protons and dark matter and all this kind of stuff? Can we agree that God knows more than us? Okay, and can we agree that he's told us what he wants us to know? That applies to us? So as we take this journey, there's a lot of books written on heaven. Some by experience, some by uh, marijuana. Uh, <laughs> you know, but we must agree that this is going to be our standard. But here's the good news, and I'm going to close with this right now because there is just no way we can go any further without me keeping you here all night. The good news is God's Word tells us a lot of stuff that people don't know it tells us. And most people only superficially read the Bible stories and they just get this idea, well, you die and you go to heaven and I don't know, you're either going to circle around the, the throne with a bow and arrow and it depends or, or you know, whatever. You know, they don't know. They just don't know. But that's only because they haven't researched the Word because the Word clearly tells us what we're going to how we're going to act, who, how we're going to interact, who's going to know us, who we're going to know, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, what we can say, what we can see. It tells us all of this, and it tells us exactly in what order. I, I got so, you know, sometimes you just want to reach inside of a television and strangle somebody in love. Um, <laughs> but I, I heard this minister teaching the other day on my TV at home, and I'm thinking, where in the world? This guy says, well, you know, the rapture and the second coming of Jesus may be before the millennium, or maybe after the millennium, for all I know. And he, you know, he had a collar and a little hat thing. And he says, in fact, we may be in the millennium right now. We could be. We may have already had the judgments. I don't know. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I can't say what I was thinking to myself. I'm thinking, where did they get this guy? I mean, you can, you can take kids out of our Super Kid Academy and they know more about heaven and hell and the rapture and the tribulation, the second coming, the judgment seat of Christ. They know more than this guy knew. And, and I know that this is not really a good phrase to say about anybody and you don't know who I'm talking about, but sometimes it seems like we're, we're taught by educated idiots. And so I'm... I want to be very clear as we travel down this journey that we stay with the Word of God. And I'm going to show you in the Word what the Bible says about these things. And we may bring up some scriptures. You, you, you'll go, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was in the Bible. And that's the fun of digging out the nuggets. All right, let's stand up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. And Father, your word says in Hosea 4, 6 that your people perish for a lack of knowledge. And Father, we commit to you, we want to study your word. We want to study you. We want to learn about you. We want to receive everything that you have for us to, to understand. We thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, God bless you all. Thank you.